What's going on, golf addicts? Welcome to the Tour Junkies podcast. It's another episode with our friend Mark Hill, our resident Tour Junkies European Tour expert in betting and DFS. Mark is a new addition to the Tour Junkies team. We're so grateful to have him. Born and based out of Northern Ireland, Mark has 10 plus years of experience full time working in the betting industry and knows his stuff. He is going to be here every week that there's a European tour event. He's going to be right here on the Tour Junkies channel on YouTube, breaking down all the action, giving you some picks, giving you some takes. So it's going to be great content. We're really proud of it. And Mark's going to help you get a lot of green screens and some winning tickets to that ticket window. So as always, presented by our friends at FantasyNational.com. Head over to FantasyNational.com now slash TJ to get 20% off any membership level, weekly memberships, monthly or annual. You get 20% off if you try it for a week and you love it. You can upgrade to a month or, or the annual membership and still get the 20% off. It's where we've been going for four plus years to get all our PGA Tour data. They don't have European Tour stuff yet, but maybe soon to come. Uh, but if you're looking for that, if you're betting on PGA Tour, playing DraftKings, anything at all, fantasynational.com slash TJ is where it's at. And all the data is licensed by the PGA Tour to Fantasy National. So you know it's good. Hello and welcome to another edition of the European Tour Tour Junkie Show. I'm your host, Mark Hill, and I am bouncing back after the Rona. It finally got the Hill household. We weren't able to record the Mallorca show. I was down, I was in bed, I was tired, I was wrecked. But back now, fighting fit and ready to go for another preview show. This week, we are heading to Portugal and I am looking forward to trying to land some winners. I think we're 2-1 and one on best bets on the show. Uh, that's encouraging, but on the outright side of things, it hasn't really fallen into place yet. So taking a bit of a, sli- a slightly different spin this week where I'm trying to factor in a bit more motivation we are going to a course where we have plenty of course history to look at, trying to find some course fits, course correlations, that kind of thing, and not put as much emphasis into the stats, but ultimately we're still looking for value across the board. So generally speaking, looking forward to this tournament at Villa Mura in Portugal, and hopefully we're going to get some winners on the board. Like, I have to start by saying, Pat Perry, kudos to you. You managed to do a show on your own last night uh, for the... PGA Tour, if you haven't caught that yet for the Mayakoba, definitely give Pat a listen. Listen, he donned a robe. He made it like a bumper version of the Fantasy Somalia. If you haven't caught it yet, you definitely have to tune in and have a look. No robe for me tonight, but I will kick off with the podcast juice, which is tradition. And this week, we're in Portugal, so I have gone for a bottle of port. A Dow's trademark finest reserve port. Uh, it's listed here as being made from wine producer Dow's finest Douro Valley vineyards and aged to perfect maturity under ideal conditions. Now, port for me has a bit of a mixed history. And this, this seems to be a run theme on this podcast as well, where, yeah, last time out in Barcelona, I went off about the Estrella Dam and, and buying drinks off homeless people on the streets on a stag do. My, my, my port experience is slightly mixed will we say like if i go back to my rugby plan days for some reason the club that i played for predominantly picked port as their drink of choice on a night whenever we had what was called a court session so the most experienced players in the team the captain the team leaders would be holding court they'd be the judges and the rest of us guys us minnows in the team we were getting punished and what we had to do was drink port out of a rugby boot uh, not just any rugby boot, the rugby boot that you would have wore that day. So not the nicest introduction to Port at the age of 18 through to about 23, 24, playing uh, rugby for that particular club. The the Port I'm drinking tonight, though, is more Pat Perry-esque. It's, it's fine, it's refined, it's, you know, nice on the tongue and the palate. And really, to be honest, it's one that you want to experience with some cheese and grapes and, and really salvage the, the, the full flavour and taste of the Port. So... Cheers, guys. Uh, Not drinking this one out of a golf shoe. May do that in the future if things get a bit loose, but for now, I'm sticking to the traditional savour the port and enjoy it. So cheers, guys. So let's get into the course breakdown and key stats that I've looked at for the Don Pedro Vitoria Villamora course. As I said, it is a tournament that we've visited a number of times already, which isn't something we always see on the European Tour. 
it, it it has its pros and its cons. Sometimes I like to, to have an introduction to a tournament where I really have to dig it amongst the weeds. We don't have to do that so much this week. We're at the tail end of the season. We're at a course that the guys are used to playing. Motivation certainly comes into it with the race to Dubai points. Uh, official world golf ranking points, not something I am going to bring up on screen when I'm going through each individual golfer that I'm landing on for the tournament. The course itself then is a par 71, just under 7,200 yards. Relatively large bent pole greens that typically are quick enough, typically measure 11.5 to 12 on the stimp. It's an Arnold Palmer design. And with any typical Arnold Palmer track, it does tend to reward aggressive play. You pick your right line and you will get rewarded for it. It's a relatively flat, uh, ex- exposed track. Water's in play on seven of the holes. And it, they did try to tighten it up a little bit back in 2019 because, you know, as we get to this stage now where bombers can overpower a course, they, they tried to introduce trees, they tried to introduce some new Bermuda rough. Whether that has really had a big effect, like we've seen some drops in the score where typically we're looking at 20 under or better to, to win the tournament. The last couple of iterations, we've seen 16-1 for George Katsia last year and uh, I think 2019 as well, Stephen Brown came in 150-1 to 1, uh, shooting seven under par, 17 under par, sorry. So it ha- we have seen a bit of a drop off from... The scores of the likes of Padraig Carrington at 23 under, Andy Sullivan at 23 under in 2015 and 2016. So there has been that bit of drop off. The course itself, length is going to be an advantage. If you have length off the tee, we have seen a couple of shorter hitters win. Um, Touched upon a couple of them there already and Stephen Brown and Padraig Carrington. But generally, length off the tee will get rewarded. And you've got to get hot with a putter. We've got Strokeski and Dada for the last two years here in 2019 and 2020. And both winners of the tournament did finish ranked out number one in Strokeski and putting. So length off the tee, putting, par four scoring. Um, from what I've looked at, par five wise, everyone's typically scoring in and around the same range on the par fives. The par four scoring here is going to be what's going to differentiate you from the rest of the field. So again, par four scoring is a plus. Elsewhere then... Let's go to the betting board. And top of the board is Matt Wallace coming in at 14 to 1. Laurie Cantor at 18 to 1. Thomas Peters at 20 to 1. Andrew Beef Johnson at 22 to 1. And Min Woo Lee at 25 to 1. It's a it's a fairly strong field, uh, relatively speaking, for the European Tour. And Matt Wallace is coming over here trying to secure his spot in the top 60, which Uh, Top 16 race to Dubai, which will secure his DP World Tour Championship spot. He's just outside that, and at the moment, I think he's in the the 80th range. Um, Touch upon that when I come to to, to Wallace later in the show uh, as my best bet. So in terms of the top of the board, Wallace is is definitely one I want to keep on side. Do I want to back him at 12 to 1, 14 to 1s out there? Um, I seen as high as 18 to 1 at, at one point. I don't know if it's still available at the minute, but... What we've seen recently, certainly, guys coming back from the PGA Tour uh, onto the European Tour, coming motivated, trying to get those race to Dubai points. Uh, we've seen Matt Fitzpatrick win, we've seen Billy Horschel win in recent weeks and months, so there is this sort of trend. We've obviously seen Matt Wallace's form, generally speaking, uh, over on the PGA Tour recently, uh, where he, he's knocking on the door. So coming back here in a field strength that is okay for, for European Tour standards, but Certainly, he would be the class of the field, and <laughs> you'd be hard pushed to not have him on side this week. But he's not going to make my final betting card in terms of my outright selections. I'm trying to look for a bit of a bigger price. I've largely fallen into that range between 35 to one and 100 to one on on this uh, tournament. It's the the range that tends to be rewarded long term when we look at the course history for the Don Pedro Vittoria. Um. Yes, we had an exception last year in George Katsia, who came in and ex- came in in good form after the South African legs and was doing well well overall. So, outside of that, though, we have had 150 to one winner in Stephen Brown, uh, 50 to one in Tom Lewis, 66 to one Lucas Beargard, 100 to one Patrick Harrington. You know, it goes on and on and on. With those bigger prices, juicier prices do tend to come forward. So, I am avoiding the top of the board. Minwoo Lee was one that. When I was doing my initial prep for the tournament, I thought I would end up landing on. It's just the putter. The, the putter really does concern me coming into this tournament for Min Lee. He has shown at times he can get that together. And we are 
we're not far off the coast here at Villamora. It's got a bit of a lengthy feel at times, um, but it's not a true links test. And whilst well, he's done well at a couple of links tournaments, I just couldn't quite get there because of the putter. I want to see guys that are trending in the right direction in that regard. I want to see someone who can shoot low and get hot with a putter consistently. Um, so whilst he does have the length of the tee and that side of it, that would be of appeal. It's not a guy who's going to make my final card. So let's get into who is going to make my final card. And the first selection I've landed on is Mikkel Kohernan. Uh, the Finn has done relatively well this year overall. Um, I'll just pull up what I have on him. Two-time European Tour winner, 2019 in the China Open, 2018 in the Shot Clock Masters, 54th on the race to Dubai. So I'll touch upon it briefly. This week and next week is sort of the last chance to, to accumulate points for the race to Dubai, which will come in three weeks' time, uh, where it's the, the Grand Tour, or the, the Grand Tour final, if you like, for the European Tour. We've got a few guys that come in late trying to get their points like Matt Wallace, like Billy Horschel has done before and others. Um, but you have some relatively high profile names just outside that top 60 at the minute to secure that final berth. And you have a couple of guys that are right on the bubble just inside that at the minute as well. And Mikko Kohonen is one of them sitting 54th in the race to Dubai. He has shown course history and course form before finishing third in the Portugal Masters in 2016. And it's this motivational factor I really have to keep in my locker this week the four top 10 finishes in the 2021 calendar year so he's definitely been showing a broad range of form at various tournaments and whilst i'm looking for longer hitters off the tee he's is strokes gain positive off the tee in general which is something that i'll keep on side and the aggressive nature that he can bring to the table as well is definitely something that i like um the par four scoring has been excellent he ranks out 22nd in this field for me and putting as well so Lots to like about Mikko Kohren. And 35 to 1, it's a little on the short side. I'm sure there is better prices still out there. I try to give the market consensus price when I'm putting this together. But if you can get a bit better than 35 to 1, definitely take it. It's right on the cusp of value for me at 35 to 1. Uh, but he's definitely a golfer I'm going to have in my locker this week. So that is Mikko Kohren at 35 to 1. I haven't put a model rank on this week because I've done it slightly different in that I'm breaking down into different areas and different. Uh, model factors and obviously i'm trying to put the motivation in as well which you can't really equate into a model number so it's 35 to 1 official world golf ranking of 174 still trying to break back into that 100 top 150 as are a few of my other selections here tonight and then in the race to dubai number 54 as i said so it's a golfer that i want to be with this week and is my shortest shot at 35 to 1 Next up for me is Adri Arnhaus, and I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with Arnhaus. If we go back to the tournament at Valderrama, I was fearing the ass off him. I did not want any part of Adri Arnhaus because the week before at Madrid, where he did manage to get to a playoff and finish with a T second, or sorry, with an outright second in the end, he was spraying it all over the show. And that's not the kind of golfer that was going to do well at Valderrama, and he absolutely flopped, which we did expect coming in. We faded him, we benefited from that, and now I'm kind of jumping back on him because we're going to a track now that's relatively exposed, exposed, fat, fat, flat even. This is the port. I'm going to just take a wee sip of port. Yeah. Relatively flat, exposed track. It's not going to be punishing for him off the tee. You know, you can hit it left, you can hit it right, and you're not going to get overly uh, too concerned about the accuracy side of things. His approach game, obviously the numbers there are dropping off because of the scrambling nature that he puts together, but he does make up for it on the green where he's coming in in, in excellent form putting-wise. Like he finished or uh, graded out fourth in putting in Mallorca, sixth in Madrid, third at the Italian Open. And he's also looking to crack into that top 150 in the world at the minute as well this week. He's sitting 156th. He's 30th in the race to Dubai. That side of things is pretty much secure for him. He's not going to drop outside that top 60 in the next two weeks. But he's still seeking that maiden victory in the European Tour. As I said, relatively good form all over this season. Stats-wise, graded out 20th in driving distance, uh, third in putting, um, you know, Overall, there's definitely lots to like. And because I'm not waiting too much into accuracy this week, I definitely think he can overpower the track. He can then make up for it on the the, the, the greens whenever he gets there. And I'm hoping a 40-1, to 1, there's a bit of value about him. 
look in that maiden victory and the Spaniard, as I opposed them last time out when I did the show for the Valderrama Masters, but this time around we're going to be onside with Adri Arnhaus. So he's my second selection at 40 to 1. My third selection is Renato Parator at 50 to 1. Official World Golf ranking of 210. He's not going to be jumping off the page at you in that regard. The race to Dubai side of things, though, he's sitting 124th. And looking at it on the European Tour website, so typically it's the top 110 secure their card and plan rights on the European Tour for the following season. This time around, it looks like there's a bit of leeway. At the moment on the European Tour website, they're indicating that the provisional cutoff is 122nd. Our boy, Renato Paratour, at 50-1, to 1, is sitting at 124th. There's not just a motivational aspect this week. He's also shown the recent form. He shot a 65 on the final day in Madrid. He shot a 64 in Mallorca last time out on the Saturday. And he's had three consecutive top 25 finishes with a 9th, a 25th, and 11th in his last three outings. So there is lots to like about him trending in the right direction form-wise coming into this tournament. 15th in driving distance, 5th in putting on my model. So in that regard... He's ticking two of the boxes that I want. I want the length off the tee. I want them to be help, hot with a putter and showing plenty of consistency and form there. He hasn't quite refound his 2020 form, so he did win the British Masters, um, which obviously does give him a, an exemption at the minute, but he still wants to be hitting that top 110 uh, at a minimum and into the top 100 on the race to Dubai. And obviously, uh, World Golf Rankin sitting the 210th. He's a better player than that and wants to be breaking back into that higher echelon, if we like. Um, so he's got himself into contention last three starts. It is a golfer that I like, and Renato Parator is my third selection at 50 to 1. Next up is Julian Guerriere. And the Frenchman is the lowest rank of any selection that I'm making this week at 428 from the official World Golf rankings. But to be honest, it's probably one of the, the selections that is popping off the page for me most. I'm not seeing that relative consistency this year, and that's probably reflected in where he's sitting in the race to Dubai at 103rd. It's reflective of where his World Golf ranking is at the minute. Um, To be honest, though, he's shown glimpses in recent weeks. You know, he has just one top 10 finish in 2021. That came two starts ago in Madrid. So he has that recent form. He can overpower this track, grading out 7th in driving distance, solid with a putter as well, grading out 14th from a model there. Needs to put it together over four rounds. That would be the concern where he's showing these glimpses in the likes of Italy and Holland uh, before the T3 finish in Madrid. He's a golfer that I tend to land on showdown um, (laughs) where I'm seeing the ball striking. I'm seeing aspects uh, round to round that is putting me onto him on DFS and showdown. But he hasn't quite got there across four rounds couple of challenge tour victories back in 2017 he's now holding his own on the european tour i think he's trending in the right direction and let's let's hope at 66 to 1 again there might be slightly better out there still i'm going for a consensus price at 66 to 1 but julian guerriere is my fourth selection for this week's tournament in villamura and my final outright selection um this guy is another fin so i have two fins on my card this week and if you like a man in a funky hat, a la Joel Damon on the PGA Tour, that obviously our beloved tour junkies in Pat and DB hold dearly to their heart, then Tapio Polkinen is your go-to man for a hat. Bucket hat, whatever style of hat you want, he's got the style and the class on the golf course, and he is going to be my selection this week at 100-1. to 1. We have seen three-figure winners of the tournament before, so that doesn't put me off whatsoever. Third earlier in the year, another resort-style course, the Canary Islands. Um, went one better at the Czech Masters where he finished second, but that was a tournament he threw away. He was right in the lead, coming down the stretch, and then, yeah, unfortunately just didn't quite get across the line. I'm hoping there's some sort of course correlation there. I've seen it mentioned before, and I've seen some uh, bits and pieces from the Albatross course um, at the Czech Masters, which would be, I, I think, correlatory to here. So. I'm hoping he will like the setup. He's got flat exposed track. He's going to be able to hit it off the tee well. Um, I think the inconsistency has probably given us the inflated price. He's had 11 missed cuts this year in 2021 alone. But he has shown those weeks where he can really get hot with a putter. He can get hot, generally speaking, across the board. So Tapio Polkinen is my final selection for my outrights at 100-1. to 1. 
best of the rest then as i touched upon every week i try to flag up some golfers that i'm showing value on but i haven't quite got to in terms of the outright selections and these guys tend to be performing the best when we come down the stretch on a sunday uh in the tournament so far that i've put up but we're not going to be deterred george could see it defending champion 33 to 1 got him last year at 16 to 1 Listen, he's shown decent enough form of late that I'm definitely going to have an interest. Another recent winner in Lucas Beergard at 66 to 1. Or sorry, recent tournament winner, or course history winner. Um, hasn't quite refined the form in 2021, but is showing some value for me here. Grant Forrest at 66 to 1. Jochum Lagerin at 50 to 1. Uh, the putter, as I said, is something that you're going to have to have hot this week. You're going to have to be doing across four rounds, and he's put he's great night number one in terms of the putting side of things. So, Joachim Lager in there at fifty to one, and Nicholas Lemke at eighty to one was another that was popping for me. So, again, bit of diversity there in terms of prices. I'm in that sweet spot range where anything between thirty to one and hundred to one is where I want to be looking at for this week's winner. And um, you know, five names there that I definitely think could be in contention and we'll have a, an interest in when it comes to the DFS side of things. So that's where I'm out the betting portion of the show. I'll come to the best bet at the end of the show. Now I just need to have another little sip of port. Um, I, I really wish I had the cheese here or had some sort of mix. May have sneaked a few crackers and cheese before I came on the show. So I don't have them to hand here because I don't think eating on a one-man show is good enough. And I know producer Sam manages to cut out my drinking for the most part on a one-man show as well. But this week, I just need to have another little sip of the port, savour it in, take it in, and then we'll get into the DFS portion. So DFS side of things then. 9K range. Matt Wallace at 11-2 leads out the the DFS board. Um, I really struggle to not have him in a number of lineups this week it means we are going to have to drop down the board to 7k range in particular to try and fill out the rest of our lineups but 11 2 i'm still going to have matt wallace in there george katia 9300 former winner as i touched upon and adri arnhaus at 9100 would be my three selections in the 9k range my fate in this range is going to be robert mcintyre and as much as we all love bobby mack he just has not replicated his early 2021 form into the end till end of the year I really need to be seeing more from him to have him on side. He's going to be popular when it comes to European Tour DFS because of the name recognition. And yeah, it's one that I'm definitely going to fade this week at 9,400. In the 8K range then at the Portugal Masters, Jordan Smith at 8,900, Mikko Kohrinen as I touched upon already at 8,800, and Andy Sullivan is the last one at 8,000 that I'm going to put up. Sullivan is... One that I really got close to in terms of betting outright, but he did have a miss. Or sorry, he did withdraw. Sorry, at the Valderrama tournament last time out, which is always a concern. Like I don't know if there's an injury linger in there. He's had a string of miss cuts as well, but he is ticking a lot of boxes in terms of the model and what I want to have on side this week for the tournament. So it's really that catch twenty two. I want a piece of him. Uh, the piece I'm going to take is on DFS. If I see after round one that he's feeling it and he's shooting low in, on the first day, then I'm going to be getting involved in terms of round-to-round matchups and other aspects within the tournament and maybe look at his outright price after round one. But in terms of pre-tournament, I'll have a bit of interest at 8,000 in the DFS side of things. Outside of that, I'm not going to be too heavily exposed to Andy Sullivan coming in, but there is plenty to like stats-wise for this particular tournament and course fit. My fade in the 8K range, and to be honest, it is a bit of a forced selection because I don't know if it's the same on PGA Tour, but on the European Tour, the 8K range tends to be minimal golfers. You're talking 8 to 10 golfers at most compared to the 7K range, 6K range, etc., which is a lot more uh, diversity in terms of choice and selections. The 8K range, I really struggled to land on a golfer in the 8K range that I wanted to fade. I did end up with Jochen B. Hansen at 8,100. He's just one start here in 2019 where he did uh, make the cup, but finished 61st. Cuts and straws a little, but the last two times he's come off a one-week break, he's ended up missing the cut. But outside of that, though, he's hit five out of six uh, top 25s in his last uh, six outings. So that's, you know, I, I'm, I am taking on a golfer that's in form, but I think you can make a case for anyone in that 8K range. So it's a bit of a forced selection, but Joachim B. Hansen is my fade at 8,100. 7K range then. Ronaldo Parator at 7,500, Julian Guerrero at 7,300, and Grant Forrest as well at 7,300. 
Forrest was another one I came very close to back in in terms of the, the betting side of things. I'm going to look at some matchups and try and get him on side. My concern is, is he going to become a two-time winner in 2021 where he's won earlier on the tour this year? And is he able to follow that up for this tournament? That's that's basically why I haven't gone there for the outright selection. Maybe I'm batting around something that is completely irrelevant when we come to a completely different tournament, but it's it's a reason that I've kept off him in terms of outright selections. But I think there's plenty to like about his game. I think there's plenty to suit him here in Villamura. So Grand Forest is someone DFS wise in the seven K range that I am keeping on side. My feed is going to be Victor Perez, seven thousand six hundred. It's a consistent theme. I'm fading Victor Perez tournament after tournament after tournament at the minute. He keeps dropping in terms of DFS pricing. He's now 7,600 for this tournament. But until he shows me something that he's turning around this ugly form, I'm not going to have him in my card. And to be honest, I should probably double check the Mallorca tournament just to see if he did turn it around there. But in my in my research anyway, there was nothing really popping off the page for me for Victor Perez. You're still paying a bit of a premium at 7,600 within that range which is very diverse, and there's a lot of different guys that you could end up getting to. Victor Perez will still get the name value when it comes to the DFS side of things, so I'm going to fade him at 7,600. He's got to show me some consistency again to his to his overall game. Uh, right now, it's not, not a golfer that I'm going to have on my card. And then finally, the 6K range. The 6K range then, Tapio Polkinen, 6,900. Alexander Levy, former winner here, 6,800. And Pep Angels at 6,700. Angels was golfer that has been popping off for a lot of guys this week in the tournament at 6,700. I, I expect him to be fairly popular in terms of DFS. Betting wise, I'd say he's going to be fairly popular as well at 125 to 1. But he's he, he's a golfer that's trending in the right direction and has shown plenty of upside that you know it's probably worth having a look at him in this tournament. But finally, we'll get on to the best bets. I say I'll have another little sip of my port, make the most of it. The best bet side of things then. I had to have some interest in Matt Wallace this week. We've seen it consistently now where guys are coming back, with the exception being Bobby McIntyre, but we're seeing guys coming back over from the PGA Tour that have shown form and then replicated that on the European Tour in the when they when they have this drop down in class in terms of the field. So Matt Wallace for me, I was amazed that you can find a top twenty finish at even money on FanDuel, Betfair, Paddy Power, all part of the same betting group or family, if you like. Like he's number sixty four in the world, so he's looking to break back into that top fifty at the minute. Completely motivated, he's coming back over here. He's got two shots to get into that top sixty for the race to Dubai and end up in the DP World Championship in a couple of weeks' time. So he's eighty second at the minute, but a strong showing this week and next week, and he's he's going to be flying into that top sixty with ease. Could well win the tournament outright, but for a top twenty price at even money. I, I am looking at some matchups as well, but yeah, I, I, even money, top 20 with those books, I'm all over it. So that is my best bet of the week. Matt Wallace, plus 100 or even money for a top 20 finish. Thank you very much, guys, for joining me this evening for another Tour Junkie show. It's uh, It's been an experience doing it on my own. What I'm going to do, though, in a couple of weeks' time for the dp world tour championship final in dubai is bring on a guest that is very well versed when it comes to the european tour so looking forward to that in a couple of weeks as a two-man show we've one more week to go after this next week with uh, another tournament in dubai and then we're ready to roll for the final of the european tour so join us in two weeks time for the tour final next week for dubai and as i said if you haven't caught the extended fabulous fantasy sommelier version of the tour junkies pga tour my cobra classic then you definitely have to catch that plenty to like about the board plenty to like about the tournament and hopefully we'll catch some winners so let's see some green screens and some winning tickets cheers guys all the best